Wait for it to pop up on Twitch to make sure my stream is good. <clears throat> Everything Wait seems to, to be going. On Ooh, Twitch I need to, to turn sure that down, though. That is not good. There we go. <clears throat> All right. So if we're good to go. Yep. All right. Let me see, make sure I get everything good here. I, I always double check this stuff now because I never have my volume set where they're supposed to be. They always seem to get so discombobulated and I don't know how it happens. It's the magic of technology. Yeah. All right. Well, here we go. If you're yeah. ready, I'm ready. Yep. I am good to go. All right. Here we go. Hold on. <laughs> Why is this not playing? See, it's enough, like the volume is all the way down and I just turned it up a little while ago. That's so stupid. All right. Now I'm restarting. Here we go. So it's gremlins. <laughs> in three, two, one. This episode. Hold on. It's Why is it so loud now? Good Lord. <laughs> God, stay there. Don't move. All right. The volume. I have, Take two. Jeez. I got the volume right action. where it's supposed to be. Here we go. All right. Let me restart this. Hold on. All right. Turn that Quiet off. on the set. <laughs> Sound speed. Camera speed. <laughs> All right. This episode of the Nerd Cave Retro is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash nerdcave. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. You're listening to the Nerd Cave Network. Greetings, programs, and welcome to another edition of the Nerd Cave Retro Show. My name is Jason Robbins. And I'm Derek Diamond. And my soundboard does not cooperate tonight because we had to start the show like four times. <laughs> oh, uh, you gotta love technology. Gotta it love work. it, we man. Love it until it doesn't work. Yeah, and that apparently my uh, soundboard has a mind of its own tonight, and I don't understand why. I think something happens with the volume knob because I have an Apple Magic Mouse. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you use your thumb to, to move, or not your thumb, but your finger to kind of move stuff around because it acts sort of like a, um, for those that don't have a Magic Mouse, it works sort of like a trackpad on the top of it. So sometimes I'll be playing with the, uh, the soundboard and the volume will just shoot all the way up for no reason. Cause I swipe my finger and it drives me crazy, but that's for another show, a technology based show. Cause we're talking about video games here, retro games. So Derek, tell me what you've been doing this week. So I, uh, Sunday concluded working Pretty much 10 straight days in a row. Ooh, nice. Uh, I did have Memorial Day off, and I took your advice, and I binged <laughs> Cobra Kai. And I loved every minute of it. Yeah, It was really, really good. I mean, there's really no excuse not to watch it, because you can get a 30-day trial mm -hmm. of YouTube Red. And all the episodes are half an hour, so you can... You can do it in a day. You know, I mean, I started. Yeah. Well, I watched the original Karate Kid first, just because I haven't seen it in a couple of years. Yeah. But after that, you know, started Cobra Kai, and it was really, really good, really well made. Uh, I loved learning more of you know Johnny's backstory and the last scene hmm. in the last episode. I was going to ask you about that. What did holy you think crap. of the reveal at the very, very end? I was kind of hoping that would happen, <laughs> and, and I'm glad it did. And the the person who shows up has been confirmed to be a regular for season two. Oh, that's so awesome! Very very happy about it. Loved it, and it makes me want to go out and buy a Cobra Kai shirt. Yeah, I want one too. I just love how they 
they made it seem like, you know, the original movie is like Daniel LaRusso is the hero of the story, but this turns it around and kind of makes Danny the unknowing villain, if, if you get my meaning. And I just love that. Yeah, there were times where it, it wasn't like, I don't think he was intentionally being the villain, mm -hmm. but he was. Well, it's like in, they say, in certain it, ways. there's a saying I heard actually not too long ago from some philosopher or something. I'm not quite sure where I heard it, but um, you're always the villain in someone else's story. Like mm -hmm. everyone is the villain of someone's story. And I, I thought about that. I was like, wow. I wonder how many people throughout my life I've actually been the un unwitting villain of their lives. Well, not to me. <laughs> well, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it was it was a really good show. I <clears throat> highly recommend that anyone watch it. But what about you? Um, not a whole lot. I mean, I, I went and uh, have we recorded since I saw Solo? I don't think, I don't so. think so. I, I saw it as well. Um, I, I have not seen it. Deadpool yet, but I saw Solo uh, Sunday night um, because our because of the the tropical storm that yeah. was not really a <laughs> tropical storm. The game was th that game was supposed to be um, the game I worked was supposed to be at five, but then it got moved up to one mm. because of the threat of the storm. Yeah, so I was I was done with work by like four thirty, so I went and saw Solo. I actually really enjoyed it. You know, I it's loved not, it. I wouldn't call it my favorite Star Wars movie, but it was, I think after Last Jedi, it was what we needed. Just a purely fun Star yeah. Wars movie. And that's the thing that really bugs me about people that are hating on it. Because I don't think there's much in this movie to hate. I think people just hate on things because... For so long, we wanted this, and now that it, and it's just one of those things. Like people want stuff until they get it, and then when they get it, they hate it, and because it's not exactly what they want. Yeah, because uh, you're. It's never gonna be exactly what everyone wants it to be. It was. I went in with the expectations of what I got. It was a heist movie with Han Solo and Chewbacca and uh, Lando Calrissian. That's what I wanted. Guess what? Yeah, that's what I got. And I loved, like, I think that the um, the Kessel Run sequence of the movie is one of the most visually stunning moments in any Star Wars movie, in, in any movie I've seen in the past probably 10, 15 years, especially better than the prequels. I mean, better than oh, easily. even yeah. in the last couple of Star Wars movies. Like, that scene was visually stunning. And, like, the part when Chewie jumps in as co-pilot for the first time, like, I had goosebumps. I was tearing yeah. up in the theater. I was like, this is awesome. This is what I came to see, and this is what I got. It may not be exactly the way I pictured it to be, but I was happy with it. I walked out of the theater going, you know what? I'm going to get that on Blu-ray, and it's going to be a movie that I watch a lot. And uh, Woody Harrelson did a great job of playing yeah. Woody Harrelson. And everybody in the movie's great. There's no bad acting in it. Everybody did a great job. The writing was great. I mean, it was written by Lawrence Kasdan. And people are... Yeah. I, and I'm like, this dude wrote Empire. <laughs> you know? like, And it was... Yeah, I mean, they had to bring in a new director. But it was Ron Howard who finished the movie. I mean, the guy is known for being one of the, you know, probably top ten best directors in Hollywood. You know, he's a go-to guy, especially for something Lucasfilm like this. And for people to be shitting all over it and, you know, boycotting it and all this stuff because they didn't like The Last Jedi, I'm like, you know what? All you little bastards, all you little fanboys can just go on and go to something else. Leave Star Wars to those of us who actually like it. Yeah, the whole deal with... You know, people saying, oh, well, Solo's not doing that great at the box office because of the hate The Last Jedi got. And it came out months ago. Get over it. Yeah. And I, I, will, I will truly say, I think beyond a shadow of a doubt, and I will fight anybody on this, the only reason 
or the main reason why people did not like the Last Jedi is because it was not what they pictured. Exactly. I mean, and there and people, because people because people don't know how to react when they don't get their way. And the thing they're doing now is they're incorporating a lot of stuff from the cartoon series. You know, there's mm-hmm. a, a lot of stuff that you know you have to have seen. You know, either the Clone Wars or Rebels to know who some of these people are, and that's what especially separates, that one thing. Yeah, I mean, that's what separates you know the the hardcore fanboys who you know who didn't know who Saw Gerrera was in Rogue One, and I'm like, well, did you watch the cartoon? Did you watch Rebels or did you watch the Clone Wars? Like, no, nah, I don't watch that. Well, how do you call yourself a fan if you don't watch the stuff? You know, you like I read the the book that preceded Rogue One. So I knew who all the characters were going into the movie. And that was another big thing that people complained about. And I'm like, I enjoyed it because I knew who everybody was. Like I already had like an emotional attachment to these people going into the movie. Like, I'm sorry that it doesn't meet your expectations, but you've got to do a little bit of homework these days because the Star Wars universe is so big that you're going to have to watch some of the cartoons and read some of the books to know who some of these people are and follow along. You know, I'm sorry if you don't like it, you know, go watch the Care Bears or something. I don't know. <laughs> watch old Rocco's Modern Life. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, I don't want to like sound like I'm bitching or anything. Like, I just, it drives me crazy when, when people want to hate on something and then have no good reason for why they, they hate it. Like, they can't. They don't. They're just like, oh, Disney putting out too many movies now. I'm like, I remember a time, I, and, you know, and watching Jedi in 1983 when I was seven years old. I'm like, I didn't know when there was ever going to be another Star Wars movie, if ever. You know, like we went 17 years before we got another Star Wars movie. Like I remember the time when st- when the only way you could watch Star Wars or be a fan was to, you know, read the books or read the comics or, you know, play the video games. There were no movies. So now people are like, oh, there's too many movies coming out. Like, go kick rocks, man. <laughs> <laughs> then don't watch them. Exactly. But let, let's go ahead and move into the news for this week. What do you say? Let's do it. So our first story comes to us from NintendoWire.com. Oh, and I did want to 19- say this 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 was given to us like little literally about an hour ago by Tyler Watson, who uh, sent me this in a message. Shout out to Tyler Watson then. A 1997 Pokemon Gold demo fully data mined, revealing unused Pokemon and more. I actually haven't read this until now. I'm very intrigued. If this week somehow hasn't been filled with enough Pokemon for you, then this latest release by the cutting room floor is sure to remedy that. The site received a dumped ROM of the game Space World 97 demo and has divulged all of its very intriguing secrets. Resetera user Erasor, who worked on analyzing the demo's contents, provided a full breakdown. And then uh, if you go to the article, there's a bunch of small sprites of the Pokemon some of which um, I do not recognize. Yeah, there's a and I lot. Believe th- <laughs> yeah, and, and these are unused Pokemon, which is awesome. Good lord, I'm like scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, and I'm like, where's the end? Well, the thing with gold is that that was Gen 2, so it has the original 150, uh, and then they add another 150 to it. Wow. So you've got a total of about 300 Pokemon. Uh, there's also trainer sprites, a um, town map, which I believe has never been used because <laughs> in, in gold, it takes place in a different region than the original uh, Gen 1. But once you beat the, uh, I think it's Johto, is where you are in Gen 2. You can go back to Kanto, which is where you are in Gen 1, and basically go through that entire region. So it's almost like two games in one. Which is really cool, but it, this is really, really cool for Pokemon fans, you know, because I've never seen any of these designs before, and the fact that somebody was able to get their hands on this is really cool. That's awesome. I, I, I like I said, you know, we talked about this plenty of times. I, I've never been a real big Pokemon fan, so but but this sounds actually really interesting. 
Yeah, I'm wondering how they did it. I don't know. Yeah, just hackers. That's... Yeah. <laughs> hackers hacking. But hackers be hacking. Hackers be hacking. I like it. <laughs> they're just they're just being them. You yeah. you do you hackers. You do you hackers. Um, yeah. Also on our next story, um, this is something we've actually talked about before. Uh, it comes from NintendoLife.com. Nintendo applies for a new N64 trademark. Is another classic edition on the way? Uh, with the NES and SNES classic editions proving to be commercially successful, it's almost inevitable that Nintendo will produce another recooked version of one of its vintage platforms. Given that Nintendo Company Limited has just applied for an N64 trademark in Japan, one might assume that the eight, that the 64-bit console, home to iconic games such as Super Mario 64, GoldenEye, and Banjo Kazooie, is next. Um, I. I can't get too excited about this because honestly, I mean, this is just kind of things that they have to do. They have to renew their trademarks. Does this mean there's an N60, uh, you know, um, an N64 classic on the way? I give it a 50 50 shot. You know, I think it'll probably happen in the next couple of years, maybe. But I don't know. I mean, what do you think? I think eventually they will do it. But I keep going back and forth on whether or not they're going to do it this year. And I would lean towards no. Yeah. Because they're re-releasing the NES Classic. Yeah, they're making too much money off of that and the, the SNES. And especially coming up in the... It's summertime. You know, they've got plenty in stock or plenty coming into stock in the next uh, couple of months for the summer. And then you got the Christmas holidays, which people are going to be picking them up. Um, when does the NES Classic get... Um, when does that big shipment happen? I want to say it's fairly soon. Yeah, didn't it? Wasn't Let me it look like it up real quick. June or something? Or early next year? Uh, I can't remember da, 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 exactly da, da, da. what I said. No, I want to say... Oh, it's June 29th. Oh, so yeah. So actually fairly soon. One month from now you'll be able to pretty yeah. much go into any store and pick up a, you know an NES classic. If they put out an N64, that's you know that's taking money away from themselves basically. I think they're going to wait until the fervor dies down on the Nintendo and the Super Nintendo. Give it another year or two, I'd say by 2020 we'll probably see it. But I don't mm -hmm. see it happening in the next within the next year. I don't see it happening. Maybe late 2019. Possibly. I think that's when it's going to happen. I think it'll be a holiday thing for yeah. 2019. And it, as a little side note, you know, Nintendo did uh, apply for the trademark for the Game Boy. Yeah, and we haven't was, seen a Game yeah. Boy Classic. Yeah, that was what we just talked about that a few months ago. Mm hmm. But yeah, like, I. Don't know, I, I I, I would be, I kind of go back and forth on it. I mean, I love the N64, but a lot of those games, one, graphic-wise, they don't really hold up that yeah. well. Second of all, a lot of the good games were made by Rare. Yeah. So I don't know what they would have to do, because to me, you can't have an N64 classic without having like Banjo-Kazooie and GoldenEye yeah. and games like that. Like You can't leave those off. Well, and another thing too, like 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 you said, there's a difference between the sprite based graphics of the NES and the Super Nintendo, and to make the leap into the polygonal graphics of the N64 in that infant era, we look at the N64 with rose color colored glasses basically because we loved Mario 64, Golden Eye, uh, Star Wars Rogue Squadron. You know, Resident Evil 2, Banjo Kazooie, all those great games, but dude, they look like crap. <laughs> they really yeah. do. Those graphics were not good. I mean, and then you add in that horrible controller on top of them. Yeah. Oh man, I that's true. Know. I mean, they'll do it to appease the the fans because people want it, but I don't think they want it as bad as they think they do. I'm hoping that, because th this is what I think is going to happen. I think if they do release it, because we've seen the NES Classic had 30 games. Yeah. SNES had 20. I think the N64 might only have 10. Yeah, but well, I, think about it. They I only would had like 180 games total for the N64. Yeah. I think whatever games you pick, you've got to tweak the graphics a little bit. Because they did it with Ocarina yeah. of Time and Majora's Mask. 
for the 3DS versions, and they actually look pretty good. Yeah, you know the polygons aren't as as harsh. The characters look a lot better. The environments look better. I would rather them take an extra year or two. And yeah. if you want to pick your 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 ten games, and they're remastered, you know maybe not in HD necessarily, but at least like you know so they look a little bit better and yeah. not so harsh with the polygons. Exactly. Like what back I can you know. <sighs> Put a little polish on everything. <clears throat> because, I mean, as of right now, you can go to any flea market and pick up a complete N64 with a game or two for like 50 bucks. Maybe less than yeah. that. So to turn around and pay, I would say this thing's going to run at least 100, 120 bucks with 10 games on it. Because if they keep it to where you can still plug in four controllers on it, I mean, that's... That's going to take up a lot of space. It's going to have to be bigger than the NES yeah. and the SNES Classic. So, I don't know. I mean, if they come out with it, I mean, I probably won't get one because I already have an N64 that I barely play. I mean, mm. I like having it, don't get me wrong, but I'd play it probably 5% of the time when you know my Nintendo and Super Nintendo take up a bulk of my playing time. Yeah. Then don't add on top of that the switch. You know, I just picked up, um, uh, blood. What is it called? Bloodstained Curse of the. Oh, what's that game called? Curse of the what? Let me look it up real quick. Blood. I can't remember. You you told me the other day. You said it was a lot like Castlevania. Yeah, I picked it up last Friday. Um, let's see. Bloodstained Curse of the Moon. I picked it up for the Nintendo Switch. Uh, off the um, the Switch shop for Nintendo, it was ten bucks. Oh, I think that might be my next review. I think so. Nice, because it is so good, especially if you like Castlevania. If you dig Castlevania one, I mean, even you know Simon's Quest, Castlevania two. Well, yeah, it's okay. But if you like Castlevania one and three. Dude, if you're not playing Bloodstained, you're missing out because it is, it's almost like they should have, they literally should have just called it Castlevania 4 is what they should have called it. Yeah. So you should. Cool. I'll have to check it out. You should go get it. (laughs) (laughs) But to wrap up our news for this week, uh, our last story comes to us from GameReactor.eu. Sega Mega Drive Classics. Uh, It's not the first time Sega has published a collection of Mega Drive titles, arguably capturing the best and most productive years of the company's history. It surely won't be the last time either. In fact, this collection is basically the same product that's available on Steam and on PS3 and Xbox 360. More than 50 games are included, a fair share of them definite classics that have aged remarkably well, and so it's hard to argue against the value proposition here almost regardless of the number of times you may have bought these games previously. It feels great to bring them over to PS4 and Xbox One. So looking at the the menu, the menu looks really cool because it's almost like you're in a like a 90s bedroom. Yeah. It's... Like, it, like it reminds me a little bit of of my room, <laughs> you know, growing up. It's got the, the little desk, the yeah. TV stand with the, you know, the Genesis on it and everything. <laughs> So, I don't know. I mean, I, I like these, you know, classic collections that have been coming out. I don't know that I will get this one just because I wasn't like a huge Sega fan growing up. You know, yeah. I, I love the Sonic games, but I can't really say I've played too many other, you know, Genesis slash Mega Drive games. Mm, I mean, and this might be something I'd, I would actually pick up because, like you, I was not. And I didn't have a Sega at the time. And I would love to pick up something that's like a a collection of all the, you know, the best that Sega had to offer. But I'm looking at some of the stuff that I I know I would want to play that's actually not on there. Like uh, Michael Jackson's Moonwalker or um, Outrun is not on there. And I think, um, oh yeah, it says here the Disney titles that I would want to play, like Castle of Illusion. They're not on there. Interesting. It's weird. Like some of the some of the games that when I think of the Genesis, the games that 
pop in my head are not on it. So is this enough to get me to buy it? I don't know. They didn't even put all the Sonic games on here. Uh, let's see. They that. have they have Sonic 1 and 2, 3D Blast, Spinball, and Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine. But they don't have Sonic 3 or Sonic and Knuckles, uh, which I find yeah. to be a little odd. Um, let's see. There, uh, Treasures, uh, Gunstar Heroes is on there, Fantasy Star 2 and Fantasy Star 4. Uh, let's see. Um, Landstalker? I, I've never heard of Landstalker. Uh, mm -hmm. Streets of Rage Trilogy, Golden Axe Trilogy, uh, Altered Beast is on there. Um, Shinobi is on there. I mean, these are these yeah. are great games that I would want to play, but I don't know. I'll, I'll wait till it comes out before I make a final decision on uh, picking this up. Yeah, I, I would. I would side with you on that. Yeah, it's know. got some good stuff on it, but I mean, I find it interesting that they wouldn't put all the main Sonic games on there, but they would put the spinoffs like yeah. Spinball <laughs> and. You know the Robotnik game. That is kind of weird. That's really odd. <laughs> uh, but um, but we got a couple more news stories to do. But guess what, kids? We're doing two shows tonight, so we're gonna save some of those news articles for the next show. And the same thing here with this month in video game history. On June tenth of nineteen seventy seven, Apple Computers releases the Apple II, uh, and those of us kids in the eighties. We lived with the Apple II in school. Uh, th this was, I look at this thing and I instantly think of Oregon Trail. <laughs> That's the first thing that pops in my head when I think of the Apple II. And like looking at this thing, I'm like, oh man, this thing takes me right back to like third grade. Just don't die of dysentery. Yeah. And I didn't even <laughs> know these came out in 1977. That's crazy. Right after Star Wars. I know. Don't get dysentery, like you said. Or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it says that the introductory price for it was $1,298, equivalent to $5,242 in 2017. Like, oh my gosh, that's a lot of money. <laughs> I don't know yeah. if I could throw that amount of money down for any computer. No, I think I would, if I had that five grand to spare, I would probably buy a new camera or something. Ooh, and check out the memory on this thing. 4K, 8K, 12K, uh, all the way up to 64 kilobytes. Oh, no. <laughs> wow, with a uh, oh, 280 geez. by 192 six-color high-res monitor. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, wow. that's awesome. That's crazy. I, you know, I wouldn't mind actually having one of these just for the nostalgia factor. But it does have, um, apparently you could use audio cassettes. Yeah, actually, I, that's what I used on with, uh, with my Commodore 64 back in the day. I had the little audio cassette, uh, deck that you could program games and then, um, you could, uh, rec rec like, save the game that you created on the actual tape. So between me and my grandfather, like programming games, we had like a bunch of audio tapes that just had like a bunch of weird games on them, like Hangman and, you know, like Snoopy and stuff like that, like Red Bear and things like, like a bunch of maze games. I remember we had a ton of maze games. I guess those were easy to program. Yeah, that's fantastic. But let's see, in June of 1978, Taito releases Space Invaders in Japan. The worldwide success of Space Invaders marks the beginning of the golden age of arcade video games. It sets the template for the shoot 'em up genre and influences most subsequent shooters. I mean, who doesn't know what Space Invaders is? I mean, even if you've never played it, you know what it is. <laughs> At the, uh, the arcade, we went to the arcade for my birthday this weekend. And um, we played the giant um, Space Invaders. I think it's called like Space Invaders Attack or something like that, where you're actually sitting uh, in a seat, but you've got like this kind of machine gun in front of you. And uh, it's two player. So me and my wife sat and played this thing, but it's this huge video screen in front of you. And um, you're, you're basically just playing Space Invaders. And it is, it's tense to say the least. Yeah. 
I kind of wish we had an arcade here. The closest thing we have is we have this bar downtown called Play. Mm. But they, they've even kind of gone away a little bit from the like old school arcade feel that it used to have a yeah. few years ago. I think they still have I think they have Space Invaders, they have a Miss Pac Man, and they have a Tron game, wow. which is pretty cool. But other than that, they've got your typical um like arcade stuff like your basketball game, um air hockey, yeah. things like that. But as far as like retro games, they, they don't have as much as they used to. Well, that's something I really miss from the arcades. Is I, They don't have the older games that I prefer. Like It's all like newer stuff and um, ticket, like games of chance type of stuff. Yeah. Oh, well. I guess the days of the arcade are officially over. Um, and that's a shame. In June of 1985, Atari releases the 520 ST, the first personal computer with a bitmapped color GUI. Let's take a look at this baby. Uh, it's a little more modern looking than the Apple II. Um, introductory price was $799.99 monochrome, with a monochrome monitor, $999.99 with color monitor. And uh, its memory was 512 kilobytes, um, up to moving into triple four, digits, up to four megabytes. So, wow, getting pretty wow. fancy. Wow, wow, <laughs> classic <laughs> Owen Wilson. Wow. wow. <laughs> uh, I actually had no idea that Atari made a computer. Like, oh, this yeah, is all new did. to me. There were they they put out lots of computers back in the 80s. I don't hate the look of this. I mean, it's very, you know, compact. You could probably take it with you somewhere yeah, and so not was, have too much trouble with it. I was going to say, I mean, if you uh, just looking at this, I would think this was something that came out like in the 90s. It almost has like a, a uh, early iMac look to it. This looks a little more like something that I would have used in elementary school. Yeah. Of course, I'm a lot older than you are, so I had to use the Apple II back in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> Back in my day. Oh, I left this one uh, for you because uh, we always talk about this game every week. <laughs> uh, this is the new Mega Man. Yeah. Uh, June 1st, 1990, Origin releases Ultima 6, The False Prophet. Just a week before releasing Ultima 7. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't want to go on like a little Final Fantasy wow. rant like we did last week. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we've... We talk about, I feel like we talk about Ultima every other week, it seems like, just because there's so many of these games. Yeah. And and props to them. You yeah. know, I mean, people obviously still play them if, they, if they've made them for as long as they have. It must have did something right. Yeah. That's, but, um, that's crazy. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, the last Ultima game was Ultima 9, which was released in 1999. Yeah, but so, then they moved on to Ultima Online after that. Uh, it says Ultima Six is an and is an MMO version of Ultima. Ultima Six Online is an MMO version of Ultima Six. Um, so I don't know if that's the Ultima Online or if I'm just talking out of my butt. But I don't feel like looking it up. So <laughs> then we're just gonna have to let you, the listener, look that up if you're really that interested in it. I'm sure Wally will let us know. Yeah, he'll let us know. I'm sure we'll get 800 emails. Like, I don't think we've pissed off the uh, the Ultima crowd like we have with Final Fantasy last week. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, wow! Oh, uh, when I when I saw that tweet, like I I just Tweets, started laughing. Messages, like, I, I felt like emails. I felt like we were victorious. <laughs> like, yep. We angered a few people. But we're That's gonna something read. that I've wanted to do is troll an entire fan base. Yeah, and we didn't even and mean did to. <laughs> no, I mean we were just having some fun. Like last, you got to understand. Like last week's show, we were taking it like like little to no seriousness at all was had during that yeah. episode. But but it was fun though. It was. But yeah. um, but let's move on. And Derek, we need to tell people about books right now. So I'm gonna leave that up to you. So, for you, the listeners of the Nerd Cave Retro Podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free, that's F-R-E-E, free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. 
Now, Audible's got a ton of books. We mentioned it at the beginning of the show, over 180,000 and still climbing. And they have biographies. They have fiction, nonfiction, sci-fi, gaming, romance. Any genre you can think of, Audible's got it for you. So if no matter what you're a fan of, you can find something on Audible. And you can use our promo code, audibletrial.com slash nerdcave, and get your free audiobook and a free 30-day trial. So just go to audibletrial.com slash nerdcave. And uh, yeah, do it. Go get your book. Do it now. But not get right your now. Book. Go get your book right now. Do it now. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> Went into a little bit of Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> there for a second. Uh, but this week we're going to be talking about... jaunty music for such a dark little uh, action RPG of a game. Fexanadu, or as it's uh, phonetically spelled here, Fazanadu. I never really knew how to pronounce this game until reading uh, online how to actually pronounce it. But it's actually pronounced Fazanadu. It's an action role-playing platform adventure video game for the family computer, Famicom, and the Nintendo Entertainment System. Uh, let's see. It is. Uh, it was developed and released in Japan by Hudson Soft in '87, and then in 1989, Nintendo of America released the game in the United States as a first-party title under license from Hudson Soft. It uh, Nintendo also released the game to the European market in 1990. It is a spin-off or side story of Xanadu, which is the second installment of Falcom's long-running RPG series Dragon Slayer. Um, this game is also, uh, what was the other game that this was in the same universe as? There's another game, and I thought I had it written, or, uh, in here somewhere, but there's another game, it's called, like, uh, Sword of the Something, or Land of Something Something, I could see the, I could see it right in my head, but I can't think of the name of it. It'll pop up in my head here in just a little bit. But as far as the story goes, the player-controlled protagonist, unnamed protagonist, of Fazanadu is an unidentified wanderer. He has has no name, though the Japanese version allows the player to choose one. Uh, the game begins when he approaches Eolus, his hometown, after an absence to find it in disrepair and virtually abandoned. Uh, the town is under attack by dwarves. The Elven King explains that the Elf Fountain Water, their life source, has been stopped and all other remaining water has been poisoned and provides the protagonist with 1,500 gold, the game's currency, to prepare for his journey to uncover the cause. Um, let's see. As the story unfolds, it is revealed that elves and dwarves lived in harmony among the world tree until the evil one emerged from a fallen meteorite. He then transformed the dwarves into monsters against their will and set them against the elves. The reason I brought that part up is because I don't know if, if they got that part of the story, the whole world tree thing, from a, another previous work of fantasy, but it reminded me a lot of Teldrassil from World of Warcraft, so uh, where which is the giant world tree where the uh, the night elves are from. And I was wondering, did they kind of maybe steal that idea? Maybe not steal it, but borrow the idea from Fazanadu. Was was Chris Metzen a Fazanadu fan back in the 80s? Um, but here's the thing. The, the game plays a lot like... Um, it's very much... The gameplay is a lot like uh, Castlevania, the very first one. Um it, but it's it's kind of like a mashup between Castlevania and um, uh, Adventures of Link. But there's no like overworld um, like Adventures of Link had. Like you go through each town. Oh, and before I move any further, I did want to say this is uh, also was I'm doing this review um, by the recommendation of Nicholas, who lives in Sweden. 
So we are. I'm doing this yeah. for you, buddy. Uh, thank you for listening to the show, and I hope I don't poo-poo on the game too much, and then you'll hate me. <laughs> um, I'm not going to poo-poo on it. I mean, there's a lot to like about this game. There's a lot more to not like about it. Whew. So before I move on, any questions? No, I, I was just going to say that I did watch a little bit of gameplay before we started, and the look of it reminded me very much of adventures of link now, yeah. i'm not saying that i think the game's going to be as bad as that game is but um honestly, my my initial more... thought was it looked exactly like adventures of link here's the thing i enjoy playing this game a lot more than adventures of link but it doesn't play as well like the controls if that makes any sense like there's a lot of platforming you have to do in this game uh you basically go to there's a town and then while you're in town, uh, you you buy whatever items you might need when you leave the town. Like you start off, like it said, in the town of, uh, what was it called? Eolus. E- uh, you start off in town. You go talk to everybody in town, basically like you do in Adventures of Link. Uh, and there's like, you know, there's a butcher where you go to and you buy like meat products, where which you use to, you know, boost your health. You also have like a magic bar. Uh, you go and you buy, you know, a, a short sword and a potion and you have the, the biggest thing that aggravates me about this game is you have to buy keys in order to access the dungeons that you need to go in in order to advance through the game. Mm-hmm. The controls are not that great in this game. Like it feels as st- Stiff as the Castle, very first Castlevania game is. Like, if you've played Castlevania, you know how stiff the controls are. I mean, they work, yeah. but it's a very stiff game. And, you know, Simon Belmont feels like he weighs like 800 pounds when you try to make him jump. But there's a lot of platforming in this game, and the jumping and the controls are even worse <laughs> like than Castlevania. I mean, it's just... It's hard to hit things. It's hard. It, you take a lot of damage in this game, and you die a lot. Um, and there's a bad bit of knockback in this game, kind of like Ninja Gaiden ish level of knockback, where if you take damage or you touch someone, you get knocked back really far. So if you're really close to the edge of the screen, and you get knocked back, it'll push you, you know, change the screen back to the previous screen. And it's aggravating. And there was actually one part in this game when I I was in town and I bought... Each time you get further into the game, there are more keys you have to buy uh, in order to access the dungeons. And the keys cost money. So I bought, bought the key I needed from town. I went out of the town, made my way all the way through the level to get to the dungeon... And I used the key, and I went into the dungeon. As soon as I entered the dungeon, there were two ice monsters in there, or whatever they, they the actual name of them are. They were immediately right there and hit me and knocked me out of the door, and I couldn't get back in. So I had to go all the way back through the level to go back to town to buy another key to go all the way back to get back into the uh, the dungeon. So... There's a lot of unfairness in this game. A lot of stupid deaths that happen because it's hard to jump. And you will, you know, if you're in a dungeon that has like four levels to it and you're on the fourth level and you miss a jump, you will fall all the way back down to the first floor and have to work your way back up. So there's a lot of frustration that goes in with this game. I'm not saying it's a bad game. It does have a fatal flaw of not having a battery backup, which, you know... I, For a I can, game like that, it needs it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I can live with, you know, a password system, but I'd much rather just have a battery backup. I mean, come on, Nintendo. Like, you publish this game. Put a freaking watch battery in it and let me save. Um, but other than that, I mean, it's okay. It's not bad... It's not good. I enjoy the look of the game. I enjoyed the music. 
I really like the fact that, you know, it's, it plays like an RPG. Like, you do buy, like, you know, upgrades to, like, armor and all that kind of stuff and different, uh, you know, potions and things like that you can buy before you leave town. But it is very grindy, too. Like, you have to grind a lot of money to get the stuff that you need. Um, because stuff gets more and more expensive the further into the game you get. So uh, there's a lot of grindiness to it. There's a lot of unfair deaths, uh, a lot of cheap deaths in the game. There's a lot of crappy knockback in this game where like, like that one section where I got knocked out of the door, couldn't get back in. So I got to go all the way back to town instead of giving me like an overworld, sort of map where I can just kind of go. It's not open world at, at all. It's very linear. linear. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there are certain sections of the, uh, the game where you can kind of go where you want, but you're always kind of going towards an ob a set objective or a set spot. And there's certain ways you have to go through to get there. So it kind of has the feeling of open world a little bit, but not really. So, any other yeah. questions that you might have about the game so far? I think what's interesting, you know, reading a little bit about the just about the game itself, it says here many aspects of the game's setting, especially the shapes and forms of enemies, are largely inspired by a mixture of Norse mythology and Japanese mythology, with some derivatives of Eastern religion, which I, I think is actually kind of cool because you know I, I've been. I grew up really liking like Greek and Norse myth mythology. I don't know that much about Japanese mythology, but th that kind of appeals to me in wanting to actually like watch more of this game. Yeah, I, I, I did watch one um, video about it the other night, which was how I found out that it was actually um, kind of a... Uh, not a spinoff, but there's another game that actually was uh, set in the same world as this, and now I can't remember the name of the game. I'm going to have to go back and find that out. Um, but yeah, it actually says here, well, another thing I found kind of interesting was Christian icons found in the Japanese version are removed in the international release. In the Japanese version, gurus can be seen holding a holy cross and images of Jesus' crucifixion are displayed inside the churches. I do remember seeing crosses in the game, but I, I don't remember seeing the actual uh, gurus holding crosses. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess that must have just been uh, in the Japanese version of the game. Yeah, that is interesting. Hmm. Which it says here the, the game was actually, like, it was well-received. Yeah. Like like it's I've got seen, really good reviews. Yeah, I see here that IGN gave it an 8 out of 10. Uh, GameSpot gave it an uh, 8 out of 10. Um, let's see. IGN re-reviewed the game in 2011 after its Wii Virtual Console release, release giving it a better score of 8.5 out of 10, calling it a hidden gem. IGN went on to call it a better action RPG than Zelda II The Adventures of Link and Castlevania II Simon Quest. Uh, Marcel Van Dyne of Nintendo Life gave the game an 8 out of 10, uh, saying it was a surprisingly fun game and an absolutely essential pur purchase for those who like RPGs. Uh, he also criticized the password system for Western audiences, but felt grateful the Virtual Console port eliminated that feature. Uh, that's another thing I would say about this game. If you're going to get it, I would try to maybe get it on a Virtual Console um, or maybe like I actually downloaded a, a ROM of the game to for an emulator to play it just so I could save it, <laughs> play it mm -hmm. and save the game because trying to enter in the passwords was starting to get really frustrating. Um, that's why I had to restart uh, a couple of days ago. But I find the game to be really fun. Um, it is it, very frustrating, but I like the color palette of the game. I really like the way the game looks kind of like the enemies of the game are really, um, very interesting. Uh, there, uh, I don't see any other game with enemies like this, like just kind of weird and kind of out there, you know, almost like a nightmare or something. Um, but I, I do like the RPG elements of the game. I mean, I, I'm going to have to ding it because it is a little 
frustrating, like very frustrating. But I would say, you know, this is definite must have for any collection. I mean, I picked up a copy of it at the retro game shop for seven bucks, which is totally worth it to me. Yeah. Cool. I'll have to look more into it because the, the, like I said, the mythology tie in kind of intrigues me. So yeah, I'll have to look up a little more about it. But uh, I think that's about all I have to say about it. Um, you know, I, I probably, out, out of scale of 10, I'd give it about a 7. Maybe a 6.5, 7-ish, somewhere around there. It's not perfect, but it is better than <laughs> uh, Legend of Zelda Adventures of Link. I, because I, they just, I, uh, that game's hard to, to like. Yeah, <laughs> I think and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that it was so different than the first one. Yeah, that well, you know, and Fazanadu is kind of like it's its own thing. You know, you don't have anything else yeah. to compare it to. And it actually, yeah. I think it, the the RPG elements that it does have, I think is it does it better than Adventures of Link because it is more of a straight, kind of a straight RPG. Like you go through you, you know, you you fight, you go and you go and fight. You get money, you go into the dungeons and you kill bosses and you get uh, items like, uh, you know, wing boots and things like that. And the further you get into the game, the harder it is. But, you know, you get more money and you get better armor, better swords, stuff like that. So, you know, the it's, it's an RPG. Like, the further you get in the game, the more powerful you become. And, you know, I, I like it if you're into RPGs and you, you like the, you know, you're getting into the NES or whatever. It's definitely a, a, a good pickup to make. I, I like it. Cool. Yeah, like I said, I'll have to look more into it. But um, is there anything else <laughs> that you wanted to talk about before we get out for this episode? No, just uh, for those watching live, stay tuned because next episode I will be reviewing Spider-Man and Venom Maximum yes. Carnage for the Super Nintendo. And we did have the, the email. That's right. I almost forgot. Let me, uh, let me put a little bit of music under here real quick. Oh, yeah. Uh, hi, Jason and Derek. I've been listening to your show since around volume 15 and enjoy hearing about all sorts of retro games I either know nothing about or have never even heard of. Air Fortress has been one of my favorite games you guys reviewed that I didn't know existed. Uh, you asked for listeners to tell you why Final Fantasy is worth your time. I think I'm about Derek's age, but my family never had a Super Nintendo, so I grew up playing a regular Nintendo until we got an N64 for Christmas in 98 or 99. Final, Final Fantasy is one of the greats up there with Super Mario Bros. 3 and Zelda. That's saying a lot, but I'm going to let you go right there. Uh, if you put yourself back in the early 90s, you got to play a game as... You got to play a game as open for, uh, open for exploration as Zelda, but it actually had a story to it. And Zelda had a story. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this was the first yeah. video game I played with a plot. And it had a huge impact on my gaming taste since. The combat is your standard turn-based RPG system with weapon attacks and magic. Uh, <laughs> the plot is that the earth is decaying and you have to get four elemental crystals to restore it. Your overworld is slowly open to you as you play and you can talk to every person in every village. You can build your own party out of four or eight or a uh, uh, party of Four out of eight job classes, and the music is fantastic. To me, there are let's see, thirty-eight bit kings of music. No, I must have wrote that wrong. Three oh three eight bit kings of music. Oh, as far oh. as like composers. Oh, okay. Uh, Koji Kondo from Mario and Zelda. Na I probably should have read ahead, then I would have figured that sentence out. Naoki Kodaka from Sunsoft and Nobuo Uematsu from Final Fantasy. Uh, from a modern perspective, it doesn't really hold up. The combat is somewhat boring, and the plot... See, that's what I don't like about RPG, like Japanese RPGs. I don't like that um, turn-based combat. I never have, and I don't think I ever will. Yeah, it's, no. it's an acquired taste. Yeah. Uh, the combat is somewhat boring in the plot, although much better than just saving a princess. Isn't going to win any prizes, but they were great for a 10-year-old playing in the mid-90s. Here we go. To explain the naming conventions, Final Fantasy 1, 2, and 3 
came out on the Famicom. Square brought Final Fantasy 1 to the US, but the SNES already had Final Fantasy 4 in development when they would have translated to Sunset. <laughs> <laughs> translated for and brought that to the US as Final Fantasy 2 someone somewhere didn't think Americans would enjoy Final Fantasy 5 so that didn't get trans translated but they translated Final Fantasy 6 and called it Final Fantasy 3 in America then when PlayStation released Final Fantasy 7 they kept that name I have played Final Fantasy 1 through 6, which are all the 2D ones, and would recommend that you guys try one since you are fans of retro games. Final Fantasy 6, which is 3 on the Super Nintendo, seems to be the most popular, so I guess I would recommend that one. Thanks for the hours of podcast and keep up the good work. Halam Akbar from San Diego. P.S. I just heard the Mega Man X episode yesterday and she mentioned that there is no overarching storyline. Each game is independent of the others so you can play them out of order just fine. <sighs> from San Diego. San Diego means a whale's vagina. <laughs> the arsonist had oddly shaped feet. Hello, um, I really er, uh, and appreciate you trying to explain <laughs> the number system, but I'm even more confused now than I'm, uh, before you wrote. Like, I can't follow that. How can I follow what that, that says? Did you follow any of that? No, it's still very confusing. But I will say this, because here, here's the thing. When baseball season is over... I plan on playing Final Fantasy 3. I, I guess it's 6, but it's 3 in America. It's Wait, on the SNES Classic. Uh, I will play it because I, I want to have yes. some actual time to really sit down and get into it. And then I will review that game. I'm going to let Derek handle that because I don't think I can handle it, honestly. I, I know people think I'm making fun of it. A, a lot of it is just me, you know making fun and just, you know, cracking wise, but I, I just don't want to, <laughs> I don't think I can get into it at all. And it's just you, not my type of thing. Do you think there are any final fantasy themed conventions out there? Because oh, we should totally go to one. God, there's gotta be, we would get murdered. They probably have like pictures of us at the front door. Be like, these two idiots are not allowed in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it would be fun. If we yeah. went, we would have to document it on video. If anything, it would go viral. Yeah. <laughs> I think it would be awesome. But thank you, uh, Halam Akbar, for the uh, the email. I'm going to yeah, refer... Thank you for the support. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I'm going to refer the Final Fantasy playing to Mr. Derek. I just don't think I could handle it. I'll give it a little try. I'll give it one hour. I will play Final Fantasy 3 for one hour. If I'm not interested after that one hour, I'm done. <laughs> so, yes. So look forward to that uh, probably late September. And we do have a, another... Uh, some more stuff about Final Fantasy, but I'm saving that for the next episode. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> we got a lot. <laughs> we got a lot of messages and emails and uh, Facebook messages and Twitter messages. So I I'm not going to put them all, but I'm going to put the ones that were, were put on our, you know, out in public. So, <laughs> or, you know, like, like Mr. Akbar, uh, he emailed it to us, so I know it's a long email, so I just wanted to throw that out there and, and read his email and try to follow it, and I couldn't, so there you go. <laughs> so thank you. Oh, well, there you go. Awesome. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so we just released another episode of Pop Culture Palette last week. Uh, go check that out at PCP Radio, or uh, at PCP Show, at, and we're at PCPRadio.com. Uh, go follow us over there. Um, and oh yeah, Derek, uh, the Derek Diamond Experience Part 2 of our Legend of Zelda Roundtable is out. I listened to it this morning and I love those episodes. Yeah, it was a really fun discussion. In Part 2, we talk about Skyward Sword, Breath of the Wild, 
just some of our favorite like moments and storylines from the entire franchise, what we want to see from the future. Definitely check it out. It was really, really fun. Both parts are very good. Yeah, it was really fun to do. So if you if you need a little more Nerd Cave Retro in your life, that that was like an extra two episodes of Nerd Cave Retro right there. Pretty much. And you, you can follow the show on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at D Diamond Podcast. Yeah. So let's go ahead and we will call this uh, an episode. Let me read our stuff here. Uh, if you would like to email us, you can email us at nerdcaveretro at gmail.com. We're at nerdcaveretro.com. Uh, Instagram and Twitter at nerdcaveretro. Individually at jakepunktastic and at Derek underscore diamond. And we're on Facebook at facebook.com slash nerdcaveretro. So Derek, please tell them what it's all about. Wow. Wow. been listening to a nerd cave network production all right so that was uh that was episode what episode one was that that was 86 86 and uh thank you everybody for watching on twitch um we're gonna sign off here for just a few minutes and we'll be back for episode 87 so stick around wow wow, wow.